Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 152 in the series. Welcome back to the Yarn Room. It is the calm before the Rhinebeck storm. I know many of you may be going to Rhinebeck, so many of you may be already there. Uh, I'm from New York, I've never been. We had some plans to go last year. Um, it's looking a little bit more like maybe we'll go for a day trip this year. I just don't know. I'm not gonna get excited about it until I'm actually there. Um, I've been to a lot of sheep and wool festivals, uh, mostly in the Midwest. They're great. They're great when they're all different sizes, all different types and shapes and sorts. So if you've been to Rhinebeck or you're going to Rhinebeck, I hope you have an awesome time. And if you have not been to Rhinebeck and you're not going to Rhinebeck, don't feel too bad. There's got to be a sheep and wool festival closer to you if that's the issue. Or, you know, maybe you just don't like the crowds. Whatever it is, it is Rhinebeck weekend, but we are going to set that aside. <laughs> and that's why I'm up in the yarn studio before the weekend happens because I just, you just, I just don't know. I have no idea. So Instead, we're going to talk about some retro knits. Uh, this one goes back a good 10 years. Not that I made it 10 years ago, but I, lo I fell in love with it 10 years ago. So we'll talk about that. I finished my blanket. So I have a couple of finished objects for you. Uh, my friend just started up her yarn dyeing business again. So I want to introduce you to her. And yeah, I think that'll be a pretty full episode. Oh, I have a winner of the giveaway from last time. So uh, usually I tell you where you can find me, just in case you're looking for me on the nets. Uh, I am knitting the stash everywhere, obviously on YouTube, uh, but over on Ravelry and Instagram and on the main website, which is knittingthestash.com. And that is where you can find all my online classes. I'm hoping to add to that library, a, a catalog of classes uh, soon. And you can find the yarn shop, the Flock Farm yarn shop. I'm going to talk about a couple of different yarns that I use for the sweater from that shop. Uh, and if you are or you know someone who is a kind of small indie producer of yarn, I would love to talk to you or to talk to your friend. Um, so please send them my way, knittingthestash at gmail.com. Uh, we're always looking for new yarn and fiber to feature over in the shop. And I'd love to get to know you. So yeah, let me know. So let me start with the retro sweater. <laughs> this is, uh, you may have seen a picture of me up on Instagram kind of jumping around like a crazy monkey in the sweater because it makes me feel like a kid again. And that's not because I ever had a sweater like this when I was a kid, uh, but it represents to me the kind of like juvenilia of my knitting uh, story, if you, if you will. So way, way back um, in 2012, when I started knitting again, um, one of the, th I don't really, I actually don't know how I ended up with this booklet. Uh, there's no, you know, it's not like there's a sticker on here from some store or something. I don't remember where I got this. I know I ordered it or I picked it up at a local yarn shop, something like that. And at this point I had like no idea how like anything worked in the knitting world. So I didn't know that this was actually pretty much an advertisement for um, the new yarn from, um, this was a fi fiber company's Tundra yarn, which is a really bulky weight yarn. It's part alpaca, part merino, I think. Yeah, and silk. Uh, and so this yarn must have come out right around 2012, 2013 when this booklet came out. So this is you know, it's like these these booklets that come out from Rowan uh, or Debbie Bliss or, you know, those other big yarn companies. Uh, this is a smaller yarn company, but it's still a fiber company. Uh, and they basically ask a designer or several designers to come up with patterns. They put the booklet together. It's a way to advertise the yarn, you know, with the projects that could be made with the yarn, that kind of thing. At the time, I had no idea. <laughs> like I said, brand new knitter, 2012. So this came out in 2013, maybe that first year when I was knitting. Let me double check. Yeah, 2013. And all these patterns are by Maura Kirk. And Maura Kirk is kind of one of those awesome creatives out there in the world. Um, when you look her up online, um, I, I feel like she's in the midst of a lot of different things. Um, back in 2012, it says she knits mostly on the train to and from work and writes about her DIY pursuits at her website or blog. Anyway. These patterns are all by her, and one of the cool things about this booklet, which is still available, not as a booklet, like, I mean, you maybe you could find a used version of it somewhere, um, but it's available as a, as a kind of electronic, like a digital file over on Ravelry, is this. So I was new to knitting. I had probably knit one sweater at that point, maybe two, and I loved this idea of like a base pattern you, for those of you who have ever taken my classes or if you've watched the podcast a lot, you'll see an affinity here with like, I was always interested in this kind of stuff. 
So you get your base pattern and then you add different elements to it basically to create all these different sweaters. So instead of just doing a crew neck, you add a v-neck, right? And then set in some stripes and then you get a v-neck stripe sweater. You can add a cowl neck, uh, you know, you can add stripes to the sleeves. You can add, you know, a different kind of um, closure on the raglan uh, seam. You could do a shawl collar, you know, just the list goes on and on. So each of these sweaters is based on this base pattern, which is called Packard. And then they all just add different elements. So the, this is Eco Lodge, which adds some striping and this V-neck to the base pattern. So yeah, it's a cool, <laughs> it was really cool for a bunch of different reasons. It, it, it hit me right in 2012 when I was a new knitter, interested in sweaters. It had the kind of modular effect. Um, I really loved the, the colors in here that she chose for the sweaters. Uh, I fell in love with pretty much every sweater in here. I really loved a couple of the ends here, not the total stripey one, but like, like this one. They're a little bit retro. All the photos are taken in a bowling alley. You know, the model is kind of cool looking. Uh, and you know, you just, you just like, these are cool sweaters. So anyway, fell in love with this. Of course, the cover sweater is Eco Lodge. So that was one of the other things. And it's one of those photo shoots where you can't quite like you're trying to be like, what does this sweater actually look like on real people? Hard to say because she's like the perfect model for the sweater. They're in a bowling alley. It's perfectly retro, right? I mean, if you see someone in a, I don't know, in a diner in the 1950s wearing something like this, you'd be like, yeah, cool, you know? But in real life, I don't know. But that didn't really matter to me. Um, what mattered was that I was not capable. I felt incapable of knitting this sweater back when I first started knitting. And this is something we've talked about on the podcast before. This idea of like doing the projects, going back and doing some of the projects that you weren't sure you were had the skills for at a certain time, kind of like revisiting those things and then finding out that you can totally do them now and it's not a big deal. So that was this pattern for me. It's definitely written in such a way that's like, there, it's not like a charty pattern. It's written really uh, in a very abbreviated way. Literally, that is the entire pattern. Uh, because it's based on the Packard pattern that's in the front. So I just was between projects. I finished my blanket. I finished uh, another sweater. What was it? The Lunenberg sweater. I finished something else. I can't even remember what it was. Um, but I had nothing on my needles. The yarn for Spencer's sweater was like en route from New Zealand. And while they are very fast at shipping, very fast, I highly recommend skeins in New Zealand. Um, fast at shipping, but it still wasn't here. And I had nothing to do. And I was just dying to have some knitting for the night. So what, what, what is most people would pick up a shawl or a sock or like something more manageable and reasonable. I was like, up oh, looking at my bookshelf and I happened to find this little booklet. And I was like, Oh my God, take me back to 2012. So I just decided I was going to like stash dive for this project. <laughs> There were many twists and turns here that really just, you know, now looking back, I'm like, what was I thinking? Uh, so I started stash diving and I found this yarn, which was, uh, is a superwash yarn from Knit Crate. And it's a blend of, I believe it's alpaca and superwash wool. Maybe it's just superwash wool. I can't remember. Stash diving. Uh, but this color, I was like, yo, that color works. This could be really cool but I only had two skeins of it. And from the pattern, I knew that it was gonna call for three. So I was like, ooh, could I do it? Could I do three quarter length sleeves? Like, mm, I don't know. But then when it came to the actual stripes, I was like, I tried finding different stashed yarns that I had, but I just couldn't find quite the right combination. Um, because as you can see in this version of the sweater, it's a very kind of, it's called petrol. It's a little bit black, a little bit gray, and then a pretty bright white. Neither of those were going to work out for me. So I was like, mm, what am I going to do? And I will admit, uh, I didn't actually stash dive totally for this sweater. I ended up pulling out some yarn from the Flock Farm Yarn Shop. Um, but that was okay because then I can get to tell you all about the Flock Farm Yarn Shop yarn um, that I use. So the white here, or the creamy oatmeal, I should say, is um, from Five Sisters Farm. And we've got a bunch of different yarn from them in the shop. I've been I've had their yarn in the shop for quite some time now. This is the chunkiest version we have. It's labeled as a DK weight, but I think it's much more of uh, almost like a worsted because I held it double to create um, this bulky 
uh, bulky stitch here. So this is all held double. This is 100% Shetland in primrose. I have a bunch of a couple different other colors of that, and I actually knit my sewy sweater out of that yarn as well. Uh, it's really a beautiful yarn. It has like this amazing drape and shine to it, and that sewy sweater I absolutely love. That's the one from Len magazine, I think, and it just has the beautiful cables down the sleeve. I'll try to put a picture in here so that you can see it, but I knit with this yarn before and I knew it was a great yarn, so I was kind of excited to use it again. And then for the dark color here, which is almost a black, but it's really a deep chocolatey kind of brown, I went with um, Cactus Hill Farm Yarn. So Cactus Hill is out of Colorado. I featured um, this yarn on a, an earlier uh, podcast, and I have a few different shades of this yarn. This is a Wensleydale CVM cross, so uh, it's a really interesting yarn. Again, kind of bulky. I would say it's like a worsted weight. I held it double for this sweater, and both of these together were like the perfect weight for the sweater. So, like I said, t didn't totally stash dive, but I like store stash dived so that I could tell you about the yarn for this sweater. Um, so I held those two double, and one thing that I noticed in people's project pages for this sweater was that it's a little, it's a little awkward to wear like a white, almost like a prison stripe on your torso. So one of the versions that I saw did a really cool thing where they inverted, like this color was more of like a um, boysenberry, like a cranberry, like a wine kind of color. And then the person put some stripes of that color in the sweater, just, just one really thick stripe um, down here, kind of on the lower body. So I took some inspiration for that and I thought, okay, I have some other yarn that was basically this yarn, but in a different color. And I'm not sure you can actually see this, but I think it subtly does something when you look at the sweater in a photo or if you're wearing it around. So I did stripes, just single stripes of that color. I'm hoping you'll be able to see it. I'll try to zoom in here. Single stripes of this kind of darker blue color here, there, there, and then I went with a full stripe of it here around the middle and then kind of phased it out. I think what that does, even if you can't quite see it or like make it out, you can't point to it and be like, oh, I see exactly what's going on there with the colors. There's something subtle about that, adding that extra stripe in a contrasting color down here that just changes the way the sweater appears on film and changes the way the sweater appears when you're looking at it. I really wish I could understand it. And if somebody out there understands like physiologically what's going on or color theory wise what's going on, I'd love to know. Um, but that's my sense is that by adding in that stripe down here, it just, it, it changes the proportion. It changes the weight, the value of this something with the, the way the stripes are going. It's how I feel about it. I could be totally convinced otherwise, but uh, I did do that down below. Um, a few other mods I made, of course, because I had to mod. Uh, I did a split hem. So I always do, whenever I'm doing pullovers, I almost always do a split hem. I think there was one sweater recently that was a, an exception to that. Even the one I have on uh, has a split hem. So <laughs> anytime there's a pullover or a Henley or anything like that, uh, split hem. And I did a provisional cast on for the underarm so that it's nice and clean under here. Uh, this is especially true because I knew I was working with stripes. These, uh, this all had to be sewn together in the end, uh, and I was gonna be working with a color transition. So trying to make sure that the armpit was as clean as possible was pretty important. Uh, and yeah, as you can tell, since this is a kind of color block raglan where the sleeves are a totally different color, I knit the sleeves separately. Uh, they're bottom up, Yes, bottom up, and you know you just create the sleeve in the round and then work the the kind of sleeve cap flat for the raglan style, uh, and then you sew it into the body, which you've also worked with the raglan. Um, and I did, like I said, I did more like three quarter length sleeves. Uh, I actually kind of messed up. <laughs> I cast on the number of stitches that you would need at the wrist because these sleeves are supposed to be long, uh, and then I thought, oh gosh, that's going to be, will that be tight? Like, is my wrist much different from my elbow if I need to make these sleeves shorter? There's a little bit of difference. Um, but this yarn is that superwash yarn, and the ribbing is really, I did it in the same size needle as the, the main stitching, so it's pretty loose. And, you know, when you push these sleeves up, 
it there's no problem with the cast on. It's like one of those great lo loose cast ons, which is um, what do you call that one? The Norwegian cast on, I think, because it's the it's the long tail cast on with an extra loop added in. So I think that's the Norwegian. It's the one I always use, and you can see it's like the most stretchy cast on ever. I love that cast on, but it doesn't sh like stretch out of shape. It just goes right back. Anyway, favorite cast on. So I just worked my own set of increases um, up to the underarm, uh, vaguely going by the stitch count that I <laughs> had down here versus the stitch count up here versus the number of rows that I knew I was going to have um, between the cuff and the armpit. So those kinds of things, you can, you can just do the quick math on that. And I ended up with, I think, six increases just to get up there, but this is such bulky... <clears throat> This is such bulky yarn that, you know, you only need a few increases to get from, you know, get down here all the way up there. Um, another couple of funny things about this sweater, there were some comments on the project pages because people were like frustrated that there's not an actual buttonhole band. It's pretty interesting. It actually takes a while to kind of, you're looking at this and you're like, wait a minute. So is there, is there not a buttonhole? And it's true. There's not, there are no buttonholes at all and she doesn't she doesn't say there are any buttonholes um and basically i love this i kind of like this technique for this kind of sweater so you do your classic henley you know uh bind off here and then you pick up stitches and do your button bands horizontally and they are button bands like you add them later in this contrasting color uh but then they're just sewn you just sew down your placket and then you sew it all the way up to here so that it looks like i guess this button to make it look more realistic, this should have been over. I guess I could sew that a little bit farther over. Um, but I like the effect. These are just decorative, right? They're just decorative buttons, which I love. I love sweaters that have those, like, the decorative buttons up here or, you know, like, across the shoulder or um, down the side. You know, like, decorative buttons are really cool. So I was kind of happy <laughs> to be knitting a sweater with decorative buttons and also happy to not have to place buttonholes because poor Spencer, my husband, is always the one who sews on my buttons. And whenever I have to place buttonholes, I'm always like, okay, so it has to line up here. And I'm putting in little stitch markers and trying to help him understand like where he's like an expert button sewer on her, but he always wants to know exactly, you know, how they should line up with them anyway. So that made, <laughs> that made that portion of the sweater much easier. Uh, and then uh, I changed the upper part here because the whole thing is supposed to have this is about two and a half inches down here. I think this is about two inches, yeah, um, that I did down here. This is supposed to be two inches, but in the pictures, it's not two inches, right? It calls for that in the pattern. You guys have probably seen this in some other patterns. Um, you can see this is not two inches. It's like an inch and a half, something like that. Um, so I went more with the inch and a half, which was fortunate. Because as I said, I was working with only two skeins of this yarn. This is all I have left over <laughs> for the entire sweater. So yeah, I kind of just barely pulled that one out. Uh, I put a call out to try to see if anyone else had any extra of this particular knit crate yarn. And of course it was like Murphy's Law. The day after I like finished the second sleeve, attached everything, you know, I put it in the bath someone contacted me. She was so kind. She's like, I do have two skeins if you want them. And I was like, oh, I just finished the sweater. <laughs> it happens, right? And it's fine. The superwash ended up stretching out a lot. So these sleeves are actually pretty close to almost bracelet length. They're a little short, maybe. Um, so it's absolutely fine. And like I said, doing this just for an inch, a little over an inch, I think matches up with the, um, you know, the width of the button band. It just, there's something about the proportionality there that's, that's just right to my eye. So this is Eco Lodge. <laughs> I would say it's not for everyone. I don't even know if it's for me. I mean, I, I think it looks cute on me and it looks very like playful. Um, and for me, it's like this absolutely nostalgic sweater because it was one of the first sweaters I really, really wanted to knit and didn't feel like I could at the time. So I kind of am really happy that I finally knit a version of it, though Spencer, my husband, will tell you as I was knitting it, I was kind of like hemming and hawing, like, should I finish this? Like, is, is it like, 
is it good looking sweater aesthetically is it like just a really weird sweater like what am I gonna do is it yeah <laughs> anyway I had like a, a crisis an aesthetic crisis in knitting this sweater because the reality of wearing the kind of like bold black and white stripes with green sleeves is not like it's not like something like this where you know it's like a classic wardrobe staple that I could wear to work or things like that um, what was really funny is when I put it up, um, I put it up on my Facebook page to show my friends and uh, everyone just said, no, I totally love it. So maybe we're back. Maybe it's one of those 10 year olds where we're back to retro is cool again. Um, yeah, I mean, I do buy all of my clothes on eBay from like the 2000s because I just, <laughs> just, I'm one of those people. So Maybe this is the perfect retro aesthetic. Uh, yeah, so that's this. This is the Eco Lodge sweater. The process of knitting it was really fun. Uh, I really do love the finished product. And I can finally, I feel like, put this to rest. Or maybe go ahead and knit some of the other sweaters in here, which are kind of funky. Like, here's another one with decorative buttons, you know? Like, I could just go a little wild. Uh, and... I can't say anything about the Tundra yarn <laughs> because I didn't use it for this sweater, uh, surprisingly enough. Uh, it, I'm guessing the Tundra yarn is beautiful, and if anyone's knit with it, I'd love to know. Uh, but I stash dove, store dove for this one, and I kind of like the way it turned out. All right, so one of the other things I did last week or the week before, we had like one final week of hot, sunny weather, and I went crazy in the house, just pulling out all of the linens and the woolens and the curtains and everything and washing and drying stuff out on the porch because I just thought to myself, this is the last little bit of nice weather we have uh, before the winter when everything's, you know, it's cold and, you know, it's, it's not as easy to get woolens to dry um, all the time and you don't have sunshine, you can't put stuff outside. Anyway. I also managed to finish my long story short, it is not a small blanket, uh, this past couple of weeks. This is just half of it. <laughs> and I've showed it on here before. Um, this, I'll, I'll hopefully put a couple pictures in here of the whole thing like spread out on the bed because it is massive. I think it must be, it must be almost like full sized, like a full size comforter or, you know, blanket for a full size bed. Um, but I can give you on here at least a look at how the corners turned out because I was pretty happy about that. I modified the original pattern. Here's the corner of the corners. Uh, I modified the original pattern so that I wouldn't have to add a border after the fact. Uh, and so this is this what you see here, this beautiful little corner and all of this edging was just built into the pattern. And if you want to check out how I did that, you can those mods are listed over on my Ravelry page for the project. Um, so they're kind of specific because I was working with two yarns held together. Uh, this is all superwash yarn. I tried to get most of my superwash, as much superwash yarn as possible uh, into this blanket. I still have some left over, uh, but I was holding two strands together to create this kind of like marled effect all the way through, you know, the greens and the blues and the purples and everything. There's even like some sparkly Stellina yarn in here. Uh, I was holding two strands together. So to switch this, the strands, those two strands with the next two strands as the kind of pattern you go, you go across, let me slow down here. <laughs> Basically go across with two, I went across with two strands, came back with two strands, just all garter stitch. And then I needed to switch to two other strands of yarn. So I wanted to do some fancy footwork on the edging so that um, those, those strands would like slip nicely next to each other um, a little bit further into the actual blanket than right on the edge. Anyway. If you want to learn more, go to the Ravelry Project page and you'll see exactly what I did for my mods on the edge of this blanket. Uh, like I said, I just held a couple yarns together. So it's all different colors of the rainbow. Uh, it is definitely sometimes scrappy, like I had mini skeins or scraps of yarn, uh, or I did open up full skeins of yarn at certain points because I just wanted to get more yarn in this blanket and it was bigger and bigger and bigger so yeah it's a massive blanket <laughs> and I think the last time I've knit a bunch of blankets I really find them fun in the background like this one was perfect for 
the last year and a half or something. Uh, and they're great background knits. I, I would much prefer, <laughs> I would say I much prefer modular blankets than this kind of blanket where basically by the end I had shoved this whole blanket in a massive sweater bag and I was turning the bag on my lap as I went back and forth with my garter stitch. And then I had a separate bag <laughs> with my balls of yarn and my cakes of yarn in it to try to keep everything you know, manageable just because this thing is actually over four pounds and you know to the the job of kind of like maneuvering it to be able to go back and forth just became too much so i guess i prefer the modular blankets um but i did wash i was able to wash my other couple blankets uh there's the one that looks like stained glass what is that one called persian dreams um i'll just pull it out here i was able to wash this guy um, I mentioned this on a few different episodes back. This is another beautiful blanket. This is half of it. I can't really hold it all up. It's just so big. But this one was modular. So you knit each of these, uh, what are they, hexagons? Yeah. Uh, you, it knit, knit each hexagon, and then you add a border, and then you sew them all together. So this one was a little bit easier to, um, you know, take with me when I was traveling or if I just needed a background project. But... Uh, I do love my blankets, and I have a bin of them. We've used them around the house for years. They're great for using up scraps and knits, you know, lots of yarn and things like that. So, yeah. So that was the other thing I finished. And so last two things, I have a couple announcements. Um, we'll do the giveaway in just a second. Uh, I wanted to mention that my friend Megan Morell uh, has created, she is one of my favorite indie dyers, and yes, she dyes superwash, but she's also doing non-superwash stuff now. I love her colors, and she has just uh, rebranded her shop. She was Old Crow Art Yarns, and I know I've talked about her yarn on here before. I have an entire bin of it over there. I knit with it sparingly because I absolutely love the way it looks in the skeins. Uh, this is something you all probably have. You know, you have these favorite skeins of yarn. Uh, so the new company is called Ramble on Fiber. She's out of Maine, um, and she just did a shop update a couple weeks ago. She's actually just done one now. Um, this late October, so you can catch whatever yarn is over there. She does minis, superwash, sock yarn, all that good stuff. So I picked up this. This is the Avalanche Lake colorway. I love her greens. They're just really gorgeous, and I hope they show up on the camera because her greens are like amazing. I'm not usually a green person, but I love her greens. Uh, and then I picked up a mini set. Uh, I think this one is called, what's it called? Um, Road Trip. And I think she had just restocked some of these. Uh, they're just beautiful and I can just imagine I have all these grandkids I'm knitting for and I've been needing some superwash yarn for their little sweaters and things and I think doing a sweater with these stripes might be super fun or a little color work or something like that so so I grabbed a mini skein set uh, and this sock yarn the green um, so yeah if you want to check her out she just updated the shop again Ramble on Fiber Company out of Maine Megan is awesome. So I wish her well with the new rebranding and the dyeing and everything. And yeah, I'm just excited to see how that grows and changes. Um, last but not least, we have the giveaway winner. And I put that somewhere. Aha. Okay. So the giveaway winner from last episode where we were talking about tips for new knitters is... You need like a drum roll. Uh, Renits for me. I have notified you on YouTube, Renits for me. I don't know your name, uh, but I am happy that you shared a tip with us. Your tip was about uh, new knitters being careful about the taper on their needles and not using, not starting with like super bulky yarn and a super bulky scarf project or something like that. I thought that was kind of cool because if you start with projects that you actually like or you like the look of, you'll be more likely to stay in the craft, right? We talked about that a little bit on the last episode. So yeah, renits for me, congratulations. And to the rest of you, thank you so much for sharing your tips. If you are looking for tips for new knitters, we have a whole list of them over on episode 151, a uh, great resource. And yeah, well, I may be off to Rhinebeck, I may not be. It's hard to say, <laughs> but if you're going to Rhinebeck and you see me wandering around, come say hi. Uh, and if you're going to Rhinebeck and you don't see me wandering around, I hope you have fun. Uh, I will see you on the next episode. And in the meantime, happy knitting.